uh, I just want to recognize the women, the mothers in our midst. So will you listen to this? To those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains on your shirt, we appreciate you. To those who have experienced loss through miscarriage or failed adoption or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes and prods, in tears and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make it harder than it is. For those of you who are foster moms or mentor moms or spiritual moms, we need you. For those of you who, who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, distance from your children, we sit with you. For those who have lost their mother this year, we grieve with you. To those who have experienced abuse at the hand of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who live through driving tests, medical tests, and overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and be a mother of your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way that you have longed for it to be. To those who, who, have, who are step-parents, we walk with you in these complex times. To those who have envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet the dream has not been made real, we grieve with you. To those who have emptier nests in the upcoming years, we grieve and rejoice with you. <laughs> to those who place children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life now, both expecting and surprising, we anticipate with you. So this Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you. Amen? Yay for moms. I, uh, I'm excited about this new series. This series called My Story. Uh, not because I get to tell you all these stories of my life, but I believe that God is writing your story. God is telling a story through you. Not that you're some puppet on his hand, but that you are in the very hand of God, the very midst of God. As God works his, his life through you, he is telling a story. Now, some of us uh, have stories that we uh, love to tell. Things that have happened that we rejoice in, that we celebrate and have great things to remember. We love telling stories like that. Others of us have stories that are not so good, kind of difficult, kind of hard to share. I know so many people that will come in and talk with me and they'll sort of stop talking at a certain place because they don't want to open those doors to those stories that have hurt them or they're holding on to or they just can't share. We all have some story to tell. And I believe that God is telling a story in you and through you, and uh, we, we get to be part of that. Here's the deal. Seemingly small and insignificant decisions in our lives turn into the stories we tell later. I mean, sometimes by mistake, we'll do something, we'll make a choice, we'll say a word, we'll do this, but seemingly small things, but the decisions we make today determine the story we tell tomorrow. Kind of like this. I went to college, this little small Bible college back in the day, in the 80s, and uh, had a conversation with a friend, went to a class, decided to go to the cafeteria. One thing led to another. I'm sitting with a guy named Rob, and we're talking together, and this girl walked in. Kind of cute. She started talking to Rob, started laughing, and I recognized this laugh, and I said, I like that laugh. 
It was a very attractive laugh because it was totally from her heart. It was deep down within her, and she laughed, this incredible belly laugh. And I sort of looked around the cafeteria. There were hundreds of kids. She didn't care for one second what anybody thought of her. And I thought, well, I want to get to know this girl. Five years later, she became my wife. I know, and so now we have this amazing family, we have these great kids, and we have this life, but that one decision to go to the cafeteria that day, to have lunch with Rob, led to another decision, led to an attraction, led to a relationship. God is orchestrating our stories. He's telling our stories, and if we pay attention to the small things and make decisions, and uh, what seem insignificant, we make decisions, we can tell stories later about it. Here's some questions that I have for you this morning. If you want to fill anything in in your program, you can write these things down. But here's a thought. How do we live the story that we want to tell? I mean, really, how do we actually live that story? And I don't mean on Facebook, the story you want everybody else to know socially, but how do you tell a story that you think you want to tell? Or really, maybe another way to answer, ask that question is, how do we live a story worth telling? How do we live a story that's actually worth telling? I don't mean edited. I don't mean like we do things and then we only post the good stuff. The selfie with, you know, the sunset or the, you know, where we visit or where. I mean, how do you actually live a story that has significance and meaning and will be able to be God's story? Or, or, Or maybe another way to say it is we need to let God tell the story through us. We need to participate in God's story. Now, I know I'm a pastor, and I know that I went to seminary, and I know that, that I've read the Bible, blah, 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 all this stuff, but the thing is, I'm no specialer than anybody else. I'm no uh, more important to God than anybody else. God is telling his story and working his story through all of us. What if uh, we're not really living our life by ourselves. Have you ever thought about this? What if God is actually orchestrating his life and story in you and through you? I love this scripture in Hebrews chapter 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Do you know why we look at Jesus so often in the scripture? It's because he's authoring our faith. He's writing our faith story. He's the perfecter of the things that we experience. Well, what does that mean? I go through a difficult thing and a hard trial and a failure, and I look to Jesus, and Jesus goes, okay, now we're going to go this route. We're going to take what happened, and we're going to move it this way. God is constantly perfecting our faith. Does that mean we'll ever be perfect someday? The scripture says so. The scripture says that we will be in him, we'll be raised up in Christ, we'll be healthy and whole and mature in Christ as we seek him out. If you stick with us the next few weeks, this is where I want to go with these sermons. Today, we're going to talk about the decision to start something. Today is really just about starting something in your life. So I want you to, in your story, say, I decided to start this thing, whatever it may be, and today may be the day you start something new. Next week, we're going to talk about the idea of stopping something. Maybe there's something in your life that actually needs to stop altogether uh, and not continue doing. The, most people I talk to say, I have this terrible habit. I need to stop this thing in my life, and I don't know how. So next week, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then in the following week, we're going to talk about how to stay somewhere I don't mean geographically, but I mean in your life. How do you stay with something? How do you commit to something and stay the long haul? And then the following week, the last week, we'll talk about how to go somewhere. Where is it that God is calling you to go? It could be that God is calling you on mission to start something. God is asking you to make a commitment in your life and uh, go somewhere. There's a number of us in this room that have come from somewhere else, and now you're here, and if you look back, you say, well, I had to go then to somewhere, and now that I'm here, where would God call you to go next? So this morning, we're just going to talk about the idea of starting something, and what I mean is kind of significant little life decisions as we move along. I'm not talking about life 
altering, you know, the end of the road type decisions, like as if you're going to start a brand new business or write an entire book or, you know, uh, do a, an incredible life altering thing, launching a ministry. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. But today, we're going to talk about three, there are the small disciplines that lead to big life change. The small things, the, the disciplines, kind of like the foundation stones of having to floss your teeth every day. I hate flossing my teeth. It hurts. And if I don't floss for a week or a month or six months or whatever, and then I go back to the dentist, are, are, are you like me where like you'll floss right before you go to the dentist and then your gums swell up and your, your dentist is, or your hygienist is like, you don't floss, do you, right? I'm pretty guilty of that. There's foundation blocks though of like uh, teaching your children chores or for us to have foundation things that we do every single day and there are things that God has equipped us with. So, here's what I want to do. I want to talk about the story behind the story. I want to talk about the, the, a story behind the idea of us telling our story. And here's kind of how it works. Um, I love using scripture. I love looking at where God has spoken in the past. So, you know Daniel in the lion's den? Picture Daniel in his life. We talked about Daniel a few months ago in our church. We talked through this, but just uh, as a quick sort of summary, Daniel is this kid. He gets brought into this country that's not his own. He's told to dress a certain way and eat certain foods and act a certain way. And all the time, he is responding to his holy God and the way God had given him laws and given him uh, a way to grow. And so he actually is a faith-based kid in a non-faith based country. And he's being raised up and he goes through these various kings. He gets to this place where he's got special favor on him because everybody likes him, mostly. And uh, King Darius is this guy and he's got this large kingdom and he, he orchestrates 120 what they called satraps or governors in all these regions. Think of them as mayors or think of them as people who would govern a city or a place. Well, Daniel stood out among all of these 120 and he was elevated higher than them. He was third in charge and elevated to actually uh, manage all of these people. And he's a, probably a nice guy, a good guy, but the problem is not everybody liked him. The problem is jealousy perked up. And these people, these other governors, they wanted his position. Anybody ever been at work where somebody else wants your position? Somebody else wants what you have? Or maybe you're a college student and you're making certain grades and other people aren't. And when they're jealous, what do they do? They start chipping you away, start knocking you down. The digital age is terrible right now. Uh, it's difficult in high school for kids who are a certain level or not a certain level. And kids are picking on each other all the time. It's a difficult age to live in. Daniel is in this place. I want you to hear this scripture in Daniel 6. So at this, the administrators and the satraps who were jealous tried to find grounds for charges against him in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. This guy was an upstanding guy. He was disciplined. He would do the law, but he would also follow the character of God. And so finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So they figured out that not only is he an upstanding and abiding citizen, he also follows the laws of God. And so in order for us to make him trip and fall, we're going to have to chip that out from underneath him. What do people think of your character? I, I, I'm just asking. What do people think of how you walk with God? Do you have a foundation with God that is grounded on the word, grounded in prayer, grounded in faithfulness, grounded in obedience, so that when other people try to chip you away, they notice your relationship with God? Do you have that? I was texting with a college kid a month ago or so, and she said, I'm having a hard time in English class because every time we go to English class, the professor who is probably an atheist, he will raise up a moral question or an ethical or godly question and he'll kind of make us write about this question for five or ten minutes. 
And I feel like I want to share my faith and write about things, but as we talk about this, then he'll have us read to the class and he'll call me out or embarrass me or what. What do you do in a situation like that? It's hard, right? Daniel finds himself in this incredible place and yet he built himself on this foundation with God. So here's where the rest of the chapter goes. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where he opened his windows toward Jerusalem and he cried out, this isn't fair. Did he say that? No. He goes, he goes, people at work are picking on me. Now, that wasn't his attitude. He's like, ah, people think that I should be this and then I'm not that, right? We kind of do that. We sort of compare ourselves to other people and we'll try to figure out a way to make something work when it's not working. We'll try to buy stuff. We'll try to, well, Daniel didn't. He just, three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed. He gave thanks to God just as he had done before. I love that. I love that Daniel had a habit in his life. He had made a choice to make a small habit, which was praying three times a day, which was seeking God in public even. And the decree was, if anybody prays to, to any other God other than the king, they're going to be thrown in the lines and we're going to kill them. And Daniel wasn't afraid of that. He said, hey, do whatever you need to do. I am going to pray. So he had this prayer habit. Here's a question for you on your program there. What does God want you to want? It's kind of a weird question, really. It's most of the time we live our lives with what do I want? You know? I want quicker lines at the grocery store, and I want less traffic. And I want better uh, this for me, less taxes. I want better neighborhood people. I want this. You know, I want, I want. What if we ask, what does God want for me? Have you ever sat in prayer and just said, God, what do you want me to pray about? It's kind of an interesting step. Sometimes we just, oh God, I want all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. And we start talking, telling God everything. What if we just stop and say, God, I'm reading your scripture. What do you actually want me to pray for? God will bring things to your mind. I pray with five or six pastors every month. We sit together and pray, and that one of the pastors who leads the time, he'll just sit there and say, okay, God, what do you want us to pray about? We'll pray about whatever you wish. And I, I don't hear that very often, and so then we'll all start praying and kind of get to a pause, and he'll say, anything else, Lord? Holy Spirit, tell us what else you want us to talk about. And we'll pray about that. It's just this conversation with God. And so the question is, what do you think God wants you to want? You all have a spiritual gift. If you have God in your life, if you've accepted Christ, you have a gift from God in order to better the world, in order to better our community and the people around us. And so what is it that God wants to tap in to your life? Because in five years from now or 10 years from now, you'll be able to tell a story of how God had perfected you. God had been working on your faith and growing you. And what is it that you should do? What do you need to start in your life that you haven't started yet? I mean, is it a financial matter? Is it a place where you go, man, our finances are so unorganized. I just can't believe that we live like this. How are we going to even pay for next month? Maybe God is saying, I want to help you organize your finances and have you meet some people and get to this. What if you feel like, I know that we should do something for God. I'm a Christian, but I don't ever do anything for God. I go to this great church. I sit under these beautiful lights and I sit in this incredible sanctuary. But then on Monday, I go back to this God-forsaken job and I hate my coworkers and I hate my life and I have to, you know, fill in the blank. What if God is saying, wait, I want to make life better for you there. What can you start doing that will honor God in that story? And all you have to do is choose one small thing. It's not life change, you know, change the whole direction of your life. Just do one small thing. I talk to people every week that are just unmotivated. They're just sort of stuck. And they're like, I don't like my life. Well, what's wrong with your life? Well, I have these habits. Oh, I do these things that I don't like. Oh, I talk in this certain way. I don't really like it. Oh, how are you going to change that? I don't know. 
super discouraged, super just not motivated. And I think, what's one small thing you can do to start a different trajectory in your life? If God's calling us into spiritual ministry or a ministry with people, we only have one life to do it, one body to do it. Maybe God is calling us to exercise and be in shape. Maybe God is calling us from being a workaholic. Maybe we work way too many hours and we're giving all of our time to a work situation rather than to God in ministry. Maybe God's saying, we need to have you go to counseling so you can understand why you're a workaholic. What are you covering up so that you can actually release some of that and do ministry more for me? What if you can't get your thoughts together and you're always scatterbrained and you just can't ever focus and move forward? What if God's saying, just start a journal and every day just write down one sentence, just start some time with me? I know it's kind of a psychological thing, but in the end, God has given us this life and these relationships and these people so that we might actually build a community of faith together and support one another and actually be the church in the world. Be the community with other people. I know people that just kind of get stuck and they don't know how to start something. They don't know how to get a babysitter for their kids and go out together as a couple and pray or just spend some time alone or stop some of the habits in their life so they can start something good. I'm going to end with this scripture in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 20. It's really a unique story. There's this old king, Ben-Hadad, from this town called Aram, and he's attacking the Israelite people. And uh, this prophet comes to King Ahab in Israel, and he makes this announcement. He says, this is what the Lord says. He says, do you see this vast army? They were piled up, these two armies, over this valley And they were going to fight each other. And the prophet said, you see this large army? Uh, The Lord says, I will give it into your hand today. And then you will know that I am the Lord. Don't hit the slide yet. Just think about that. The Lord says, I'm going to give you this victory. Have you ever prayed for God to do something in your life? And you're waiting for it? And you want God to act? Here's the thing for us is, as Christians as we go, God, I need you to heal this situation. I need you to fix this problem. I need you to come to my rescue. I need you to, right, and fill in the blank, whatever the blank is, and we just wait for God, which is okay. But I don't know if it's the greatest step of maturity. I mean, it's good to wait on God. Come on, God. You said you're gonna win this victory for me. You said this, I'm going to beat this army. So this King Ahab is like, sounds good. We'll win tomorrow, right? What, what do you do as the king? You're the king of this army. And the prophet says the Lord is going to come and win. Great. I'll just sit back and wait. Is that what we're supposed to do? Listen to what the king says. He says, uh, but who's going to do this? Asked King Ahab. And the prophet replied, this is what the Lord says. The young officers of the provincial commands will do it. And then the king says, well, well, who's going to start the battle? And the prophet goes, you will. Oh, I love that. The king is like, wait, 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 let's back up five minutes. You just said the Lord is going to win this victory. Why doesn't the Lord do it? And the prophet says, well, because you need to get to work. You're going to start this thing. I think sometimes we want God to just do everything. And when God doesn't do everything, we blame him for not doing the right thing. Right? Why did you let this happen in my life? Why did you allow me to go through this hurt and this pain and this loss and this divorce or this breakup or this bankruptcy or this whatever? And we blame God because God let it happen when What if God is saying, well, I I want you to work too. I want you to start something. I need you to make a move. I need you to participate with me in this thing. Some people look at me and they say, well, look at you. You're a pastor of a church and you've got great teenage kids that walk in faith and you've got a great marriage and you've got all this great stuff in your life. We had these high school reunions. You know, you go back and people compare each other to each other and this and that. It's horrible. And I think to myself, 
Well, it's not an accident. I mean, I invest in my kids. I invest in reading the scriptures. My daughter said to me the other day, how do you just know where all these Bible verses are? Somebody said, okay, there's this verse about the Holy Spirit coming and then there was fire on their heads. And I said, oh, it's Acts 2. And she, how do you do that? How do you just know that scripture is? I said, well, because I've been reading it for a long time. You read a little bit here and there. You decide to do one small thing and your story begins to change later. You decide the small things and God will tell the story. What if in five years we could all brag about something that God is doing in our lives because we paid attention to the small things that God was doing and we participated. We listened. We obeyed. We walked with God. We gave God the credit. That'd be awesome. I'm going to end with this. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him as was his custom. I love that Jesus had habits. I love that he had traditions. I love that he would go places that was customary. His people knew where he would go. He would bring people some. What if we were like that? What if we had a habit, a custom? What if people knew that on Thursday nights you'd be praying for the list of people in your family? What if people knew that at this location in this time of the week or the month you would be doing this thing and they could rely on you and trust in you? And what if in five years people came to you and said, oh, can you help me with this issue? I've been watching your life and your life is telling this story of God and I want to be part of that. That's my hope for us. Let's pray. Father, on this Mother's Day, we celebrate the lives of women. We celebrate the stories of women and the lives, the stories that their lives tell. And God, in a greater way, we celebrate you because you're telling your story through them, through moms who are loving and caring and gracious and kind, through women who are nurturing and and loving. God, we pray for those like the list I read, those that are hurting and sad today because it's a hard day. We ask that even in the hard times, Jesus, you would give us your strength and your hope for the future. Allow us to tell the story tomorrow of what you've done in our life today. There might be somebody in this room this morning that doesn't know you personally, God. Maybe today's the day where they open up their heart to you and receive you and say, Lord, come in my life, start telling your story through me. God, I pray for that individual this morning who wants to open their heart to you and they simply say, God, you come in, you be the author of my story. I invite you in. God, I ask now that you'd move in this place as we sing worship to you and we close this morning. We, we don't stop our faith, we open our eyes to a greater revelation from Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you know why we do baby dedications in the first place? It's because there's so much life and potential in a child, right? There, there's so much that they can live for and there's so much that their life can tell a story about. And don't forget that as an adult. You're still a child in God's eyes. God is creating and writing a life story about you. Don't just get old and be like, ah, oh, nothing more to live for. No, nothing more to really do for God. God, you know, I'm, I'm retired. Oh, I'm married. I've already got kids. I've done college. I'm, don't do that. Ask the Lord, what do you want to tell through me? What's the story that you're writing in my life? Amen? Will you receive today's blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go with God.